Having gone through the mixing process of the drums for this track, let's take a look at the guitars, bass, and vocals. And as ever, it's worth bearing in mind that your end product is always going to be limited by the quality of your source tone. So remember that you've got to be working with the very best tracks you can in order to get the best results. So a lot of the techniques that you'll be seeing me apply here today are fairly minimal, and that's just a reflection of the fact that the tracks already sound pretty decent. Also, it's worth noting that I do use a kind of top-down mixing approach, as we touched on earlier. So although some of the moves seem very minimal on these tracks, don't forget that there is a bit of extra top end and bottom end being added on the instruments, not the vocals though. The tones that we've got to work with here for the bass are a DI channel and then an amp track, which is a kind of distorted um, bass tone, which is kind of in keeping with what I normally do for, for my bass tones. And this was recorded by me with my uh, Dingwall NG2 four string model in E standard. So um, it didn't actually have to do very much to the bass guitar to get it to sit into the mix really well here. I'm going to start by disabling all of the processing this time and then um, I'll show you what each bit's doing, but you know, firstly, I think it's worth talking about achieving the best consistency that you can at the playing end. Uh, as you can see here from the DI, that's with no compression. You can see I've, I've really aimed to get my playing as consistent dynamically as possible. And this is kind of crucial to me to be able to um, get a low end, especially on the bass guitar, that feels really consistent. Um, and you don't have to hyper compress to try and get it to sound consistent, but I mean, you're never going to be able to make up for inconsistent playing through compression because just the, the timbre of every single note is going to be so different. You can also see here that for the verse section, I've played at a much lower dynamic. And, and just like with the drums, it's really crucial, I think, that if you want something to sound fairly soft, to track it that way. Um, so you can see here that the, the DI drops down significantly in volume, though the distorted amp track doesn't so much because of the distortion that it's running through. Um, so let's just take a little listen to the DI first in the intro. And then the amp track. So the amp track is using, actually funnily enough, a um, a stock logic plugin. Uh, it's called Grit. It's like a, essentially a recreation of a Proco rat pedal. And I'm running that straight into an impulse response that I made. Um, and essentially that forms the bulk of my tone on, on this track. I'm just kind of blending that with the DI to a small extent. But on the DI, I kind of wanted to give the attack character a little bit more juice. So I thought it'd be nice to compress it. And I thought we could use uh, the smash and grab compressor. I set it to the overhead mode, which gives a relatively transparent character. And I used it in smash mode, which gives it the, uh, the kind of more controlled transient. So uh, I'll show you what that's doing on the channel here. I'll start with it bypassed and then, and then initialize it. So while we've got them at hand, I actually uh, use the beef and air controls a little bit. So I'm, I'm boosting up the beef a little bit to give a little bit more sub low. And then I'm, I'm cutting the air just to, to trim off a bit of the finger noise that you might be getting, or, or pick noise perhaps. Just that the kind of um, very obviously DI'd part of the signal, just give it a little bit more of a rounded top. So um, I think this actually has worked out really well on bass for this use. The other thing I've done is actually I've used a bit of saturation. Uh, I found that the saturation in, ta in tape mode in particular sounds really cool on the DI. So I'll show you what that does just as an aside, but I'm not using it to a particular extreme. So you could hear as it got really aggressive there. It started to sound a lot like a, a cool distortion pedal effect almost. It's well worth bearing in mind for, uh, yeah, for use in the future. You could even try running that into a cabinet impulse response perhaps just to see what happens. Um, so once the compression was done, I still felt like I wanted to trim the peaks down a little bit more. So similarly to what I did with the Tom tracks earlier, I'm using a limiter here just to trim off a bit of the flap from the front end. It sounds like this. It's a really subtle difference. We're talking about two, three dB, if that even, but it just makes sure that everything's kept exactly in check. Um, the amp track didn't really need any processing on its own apart from I just, I thought I could hear quite a, a kind of strong resonant node here at about 12, 20 Hertz. I'll show you what that sounds like if I boost it just to, to show you what I mean when I say strong resonant node. 
it's quite common when you distort a bass guitar or any guitar for that matter that you start to get these certain frequencies that start to dominate and you can hear them ringing out on top of everything else. So when you can identify those, it's often worth cutting a little bit of it out of the signal just to maintain a more clean frequency response. I find that sometimes you might want to reduce the mid-range in general on an instrument and then realize that actually it's just one really narrow band of frequencies that are peaking and using a kind of traditional fairly wide cue to cut that area would be reducing a lot of the good information at the same time. So I try and keep the cues uh, to quite a small amount when doing this kind of work in order that you're not really affecting the general EQ curve of the instrument. Looking at the actual bass bus, you'll be able to see the processing which I've done here, which is being done by two different fab filter plugins. Um, I'm high end low passing as one typically does on most channels. Cutting a little bit of the, um, the strong resonances that I was getting around about 150 hertz, 165 hertz in this case. Um, there's a very strong note on the bass there, especially with it being tuned to E, it's quite high up in the spectrum. And instead of having um, the kind of, almost into the, the upper bass region, I guess you'd say, being too prominent, I thought it better to cut there and instead fill it with a lot more sub. And you'll see over here on this multiband compressor that is only instantiated on the, the low end. I'm doing a similar thing actually, in fact it's almost exactly the same, only being done with a shelf boost here um, for the low end. So essentially what the Pro MB is doing is it's uh, compressing, it's, it's drastically reducing the dynamic range of the low frequencies in two different bands. And as, as far as the kind of 150 hertz regions goes, it's cutting them and uh, below that it's actually boosting it to give us a really nice solid sub. So I'll start by showing you what the EQ does and then I'll bring in the, um, the multiband comp. And the keen-eyed of you would notice that I'm getting a kind of similar smiley face kind of thing happening here on the frequency uh, chart like I was getting with the toms, the kick, the snare. There's definitely something in that. It's something which I look for in a lot of instruments. And then bringing in our multiband compression, sounds like this. There's just a sense of it getting tightened up when you engage the multiband compressor because you know it's not just a fixed EQ curve, so it just sounds like there's a lot more consistency between the notes. There's not um, EQ, there's not frequencies being cut when it's not necessary. Um, instead, like all the notes retain the same amount of body and the sub lows sound very kind of pinned and non-dynamic, which I think is good. You want your bass guitar to have a very consistent low end underneath the rest of the instruments. And I found that with that, I was pretty much done as far as the bass processing on this track. The lower you tune on bass, I feel like the more problems you run into with managing the low end, but in E standard, it's, uh, it's really quite easy going. So that was a relatively easy bass track to work with.